The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the itinerant star hopper's guide to time slippage gets a third edition before the first edition is even published. Near-orbit debris fields unexpectedly push loathsome, squishy older gods back into their pocket universes. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel, and we also have... Victoria Lambert. Who is Bain Intern this spring. This time we talk with William Mark Simmons for our interview. Mark is the author of A Witch in Time, which is a new entry in his excellent Half-Life Chronicles. It's been a few years since the last book, which I think was Habeas Corpses. Uh, came out, but half-vampire detective and problem solver Christopher Chete is back at it again, and uh, this is sort of a humorous and yet uh, pretty serious action-adventure take on on vampires and scary stuff. It's really cool. Mark's a great writer. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. Now, here's the news. Hey, the April hardcovers are out of the chutes and into the arena, at booksellers, I mean. It's a grand sight, and they are some great reads. Out now is 1637, The Polish Maelstrom, by Eric Flint. Strange weather. The Ottoman Empire has captured Vienna and is now laying siege to the Austrian government in exile established in the city of Linz. Both the United States of Europe and the Kingdom of Bohemia have come to Austria's assistance, but everyone knows... This is going to be a long and brutal struggle. Meanwhile, Poland is coming to a boil. The Bohemians have sent an army into Poland with the goal of expanding King Albrecht Wallenstein's growing empire in Eastern Europe. When Grantville General Mike Stern sends the Hangman Regiment of his 3rd Division into the region, they find themselves at the center of a growing storm, one that threatens the continued existence of the United States of Europe and those doughty West Virginians who got thrown back in time. The maelstrom in Poland grows and grows and grows. Will it drag all its displaced Americans and their allies down with it? Also, out in April is A Witch in Time by William Mark Simmons. Something Wiccan this way comes. As founder of After Dark Investigations, half-vampire Christopher Chete has seen his fair share of the seedy side of the supernatural world. Most recently, someone cut the gas line of his SUV and then ran over him with a semi-truck while he waited on a tow. But this is the third time Chris has died. It's old hat at this point for him. Now, awakened in a world he doesn't quite recognize, he'll have to use his wits to keep the supernatural world at bay. Interpol is interested in some of his associations with Vlad Dracul's grandson, better known as Dracula, and a trio of witches from Greek myth want him dead. And for good this time. Bad enough. But what's worse is that the IRS is looking into his tax returns and not at all liking what they find. Now that's really terrifying. Ooh. A Witch in Time by William Mark Simmons and 1637 The Polish Maelstrom by Eric Flint are now available at booksellers everywhere. I want to welcome William Mark Simmons to the podcast. Hello, Mark. How's it going? It's going very well right now, except for the fact I'm in day three without Internet. And uh, I'm amazed at uh, how much more I'm dependent on the Internet than I actually thought I was. So uh, hopefully I'll have Internet yet before the end of the day. Yeah. Well, I hope you do. Uh, Before he turned his attention to science fiction, William Mark Simmons was winning awards for his writing, first as a newspaper journalist and later as a broadcast copywriter. His first book was a finalist for the Compton Crook Award and made the Locust Best list in 1991. When he isn't working, Mark is in front of the camera or microphone, having worked in television and now radio. He's the morning voice for Radio Kansas and can be heard throughout half of the Sunflower State. I can really tell you've got a radio voice, Mark. Well, thank you. And, and actually, uh, to catch up a little, 
Uh, I have actually finally retired as of the last few months. It seems like retirement is not a cutoff date, but a series of diminishing events before you're actually free. So um, that's all true up until just a few months ago. And now I'm, I'm supposedly carefree and uh, have lots of time, but that's not been the case so far yet. Um, but, yes, I, I was the voice of Radio Kansas up until um, late last year. Very cool. Uh, well, happy retirement. Well, thank you. I, I think it's going to leave me more time to write, but so far uh, lots of other things keep intruding, So, uh, one of which is trying to get a, a web page back up without the internet. So, so but I, I, I'm really looking forward to the next uh, several projects that have been sitting on the back burner for uh, some years now. Well, one of the things that, uh, that we now have before us is um, your new book, which is A Witch in Time, which is uh, volume five of the Half-Life Chronicles. It is out after several years of hiatus in the series. Um, can you... I don't want to. Di- I want to dive into the book and and, uh, t- and talk about everything that happens a little bit. Uh, but can you tell us where we begin in the series? What's happened before with with um? It's Christopher Chete, right? Is that how we say his, your main character's name? Yes, Chete. And uh, you know, and by the way, his last name is actually uh, the name for the castle that Elizabeth Bathory uh, lived in. So uh, it seemed like a, a fitting, fitting name for the protagonist who's uh, a little bit uh, undead, like being a little bit pregnant, I suppose. Uh, calling it the Half-Life series is one alternative. I used to refer to it as the Almost a Vampire series since uh, this has got one foot in the grave and the other foot presumably on a banana peel. One Foot in the Grave was the first book uh, which came out back in, oh gosh, when was that? That was back in 1996 it came out. So it's been about 23 years from One Foot in the Grave all the way up to A Witch in Time. And uh, talking about hiatus, Dead Easy, which is the fourth book in the series, actually it's been about 12 years since Dead Easy came out. And, and A Witch in Time, or something wicked this way comes, is the fifth and final book, presumably, in the series that uh, sort of closes the circle and also uh, finishes the arc of Dead Easy. Uh, One Foot in the Grave started off, uh, to get back to your question, with uh, uh, Chris Chase, who uh, part of the mystery uh, in the first part of the book was why is his body changing so, and it's not puberty. Uh, it turns out that uh, he has lost time in his memory and uh, received or was uh, a participant in a, a blood transfusion to a vampire that had been uh, terribly burned in a barn fire in, in Kansas. And uh, the vampire board goes that you become undead by uh, not only having your blood uh, consumed by a, a vampire, but also then they give their blood to you to complete uh, the transition from the living to the undead. Well, Chris was never bitten. He was, uh, instead, it was sort of a dirty transfusion. And I, I decided the science would be there's a virus in the blood and a virus in the saliva, a virus A and a virus B, if you will, that combine to create a super virus that creates the undead condition. Well, people have been presumably bitten by vampires, but not transitioned to undead. And so they have virus A, but no one's ever had virus B without virus A. And so uh, the effects on on Chris Chete is unique and unusual. So he's, he's a little bit undead, but not really, but not really human anymore either. And so the series progresses from that unique condition where the living would like to get a hold of him, possibly to put him in a lab or even do dissect him, and the dead would also like to get their hands on him for various reasons. And his life becomes a, a long, um, uh, what's the word I want? He, 
He's on the run, essentially, throughout his life from uh, both uh, sides of the fence and has to deal with ways to understand his own changing condition and try to not become a monster in the process. So that's, that's the setup in, in One Foot in the Grave. And then we follow that with Dead Easy, uh, Habeas Corpses, and then Dead Easy. Did I say Dead Easy? Yeah. Um, let's... Uh, I meant uh, not Dead Easy, Dead on My Feet, then Habeas Corpses, Dead Easy, and then finally now A Witch in Time, which closes the circle. Yeah. And he has... Um... One foot in the grave, dead on my feet, habeas corpses, uh, dead easy, and a witch in time. Yeah, the I remember these, but you know, when these were coming out, I was writing ad copy for Bain. That was my first job, or one of my first jobs for Bain, and I, I used to love them when they came in because I really enjoyed them uh, greatly. You have this um, combination of learnedness and uh, and wackiness. And, and science fiction and fantasy that is just this this wonderful sort of witch's amalgamation in these books that's would would you call them humorous i'm not sure they're really humorous well yeah, yeah that's a good point uh the first three books i ever wrote outside of the series were humorous uh, sci-fi fantasy and doing humorous horror which is the dead easy series or the 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 half-life series is kind of a balancing act between trying to write something that hopefully is horrific and scary enough to to do justice to the idea of horror and the themes of horror. And I think Chris's life is sort of a horror and like the concept of madness in Hamlet, which uh, posits that Hamlet had to act crazy to maintain his sanity. The crazier he he acted in the face of the madness that was in, in closing around him, the more healthy he was in dealing with it. And Chris has to deal with the, the horror around him with a certain amount of humor. But at the same time, I, I've read stories over the years that tried to be funny and serious. And generally, uh, it's a hard thing to do where you don't end up with cardboard characters just doing a joke fest, and at the same time, try to see the humor in the darkness that, that sort of is in the series. And, and part of the formula to doing that, too, was to, I can't say it's a perfect formula, but in each book, I tried to start off with a particular classic trope. Like the first book is, you know, I mean, you would think it's vampires, but really the vampires are more of the background. The first uh, trope in the first book is the mummy, and the second book is zombies. The third book really riffs on the Frankenstein uh, uh, concept, and the fourth book was really Cthulhu and the Lovecraftian uh, mythos. And then each book also generally has a historical uh, big bad. Uh, we had, uh, oh, Dr. Joseph Mengele and habeas corpses. We had uh, Elizabeth Bathory and Dead on My Feet. We had Marie Laveau and Rasputin in Dead Easy. And so there's a, there's a kind of a formula. And then I throw in multiple mythologies on top of that where I kind of combine them in a blender like a Rubik's Cube of the Damned and try to mix in the historical events and always have a science fact slash science fiction uh, premise underneath. So it, like you say, it's a real witch's brew. And uh, having that blend of humor and horror, I've, I've, over the years at book signings and events, I've had parents come up to me and say, oh, this is funny. Can I get, should I get this book for my kids? And I go, well, how old are they? Because it's, it's kind of a grown-up book, and there's some grown-up situations that uh, I'm not going to assume at what age young minds can be introduced to these things. I had to fight to get a library card for the adult section when I was like in the fourth grade because I wanted to read Frankenstein and Dracula and you couldn't get those books unless you had an adult library card and that was a, a process that was interesting. So I wouldn't presume to dictate at what age young minds could read my books. They're not that X-rated or anything, but Nonetheless, parents are looking for something 
for their young kids to read and enjoy because it's funny, I'd say, yeah, it's not that either. <laughs> yeah, well, it would. It, I think it would be an advanced youngster that would want to read this because you know, uh, Chris is um, is uh, is hit on a lot by the supernatural entities around him. For one thing, kind of a monster magnet in some ways. Yes, exactly. Um, it, the uh, the other thing maybe to bring us up to speed on is is where he is emotionally. He has lost his family, and he has a sort of ghostly connection with another set of... Where is he with that at the beginning of the book? Um, Because he's not a happy camper at the beginning of the book. No, you know, at the end of Dead Easy, uh, he had lost everyone. His his extended family, of course, he lost his original family, his wife and daughter, back in one foot in the grave, and had the horrific experience of waking up next to them in the morgue and seeing what was left of their bodies after a rather horrific car crash with a semi, um, which really, he continues to have the PTSD of that experience throughout the book. And he has an increasingly um, angry uh, attitude or or relationship with uh, the higher powers, such as they may be, at one point in uh, a which in time someone suggests to him that he that he is God's sword and he gets very angry about that and but finally admits he might be God's pen knife or his box cutter <laughs> but uh, he's really at the point uh, where we go into a witch in time where it's been a couple of years since dead easy and he has a death wish. He's actually been in therapy, and his therapist has said, you have a death wish. And his problem with uh, fulfilling that wish is the uh, the the moral uh, and uh, metaphysical guidelines that say, if you commit suicide, you cannot be reunited with your loved ones. So he's battling the impulse to give in to despair, and allow himself to be an easy target, and at the same time, angry that the latest vampire hit squad who shows up on his doorstep, so to speak, uh, can't close the deal. And he's, he tells them that they're just a big tease to go back if they can't if they can't do it right. And um, so he's really he's really in a dark place. And uh, I felt like this being the final book in this series and closing the circle, I needed to address. This person who has been, I'd like to think, uh, in a sense, he has been God's sword. Uh, unexpectedly and uh, not, you know, uh, he, he sort of stumbled into it. He doesn't uh, go up against the forces of darkness as much as stumble into their path and then try to figure out how, how to get back out again. And I have to say, one of the running jokes of the series from the first book is that Chris is Chris is a planner. He's a researcher. He's a master quite uh, an armory. He has all kinds of guns now with silver frag loads and wooden bullets. And the running joke is that they never end up being a solution to anything. He always has to MacGyver his way out of each situation with other items at hand. So, Yeah. Well, occasionally, I mean, he did, he did use some... He used some silver knives to good advantage in in witch in time that he had in his pockets. And he had he had a couple of things in his pockets that were not the typical uh, heavy caliber weaponry you'd expect. Uh, the auto modes mods, excuse me, the auto mods that I mentioned uh, when they're back at the house, and I don't want to give too much away, but the auto mods, the flashlights, are actual flashlights that were developed uh, by some Danish. Engineer, and I ran across this in Popular Mechanics during my research, and I thought, "Wow, <laughs> what a great weapon uh, against creatures that are, that are sensitized to light. They're sort of like the uh, heavy artillery versus the uh, uh, Jedi lightsaber that he uses earlier in the book." Yeah, that was that was cool how he uh, how he used those things to uh, to take on the the idiot. The idiots that thought they could. That's the thing about him is that um, Chris is 
he's a professor, right? I mean, he's like a classics professor, and so all these creatures from mythology show up, and he knows their backstories. Right, and, and American lit, and that was especially helpful since uh, the witch in time uh, deals into uh, both the Platonic uh, pantheons, but especially uh, Greek mythology, because we've got uh, oh, we've got the uh, the Gray Sisters who show up. We've got uh, uh, references to Nix and the Fates and the Furies uh, as a motorcycle game, the uh, gang, uh, the what did I refer to them? The um, uh, the Fast and the Furies uh, that are uh, chasing them down on motorcycle. And then we've got the, the Impusa, we've got the the Lamia, and you can search for the, uh, of course, the uh, unavoidable, the Silence of the Lamia line somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you have uh, one of your characters, uh, one of your characters calls them, uh, they, she can't remember the name for them or something, and she calls them the Sheepala or whatever you call them, right? <laughs> I, 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 I don't remember the. Yeah, yeah. It's I, I think it's Car- Carmela. The, 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 the Lamia, and he says, oh, yeah, the Sheepala? He says, no, no, the Lamia, gosh. You know, yeah, so. Yeah. There's also a lot of uh, Viking and Nordic mythology in the book. Yeah, we have uh, the Norns show up, and uh, 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 one of the banner who uh, tries to say that her name is Vana, we don't know what her name ultimately is, but uh, she's she's also a free agent in this and trying to recruit him for Ragnarok, and uh, everything is lining up for an end-of-days event, whatever your mythology is, because... We start off with the concept of Pandora's box, which may or may not be a box, uh, possibly coming open soon from allowing uh, an interdimensional portal to open up to allow the unspeakable uh, uh, intelligences and uh, the madness from a dimension beyond to come into our world and end life as we know it. So uh, there's, there's a lot going on. <laughs> Yeah. Well, let's, I mean, there's, uh, we don't want to, of course, give too many spoilers, but um, we can say, I think we could probably say up to what um, what Anne Harkwind is doing um, or is trying to, uh, to to guide Chris through. Can we talk a little bit about the, the very beginning of the book and, and who shows up and what's going on? Uh, I believe it's one of the one of the Norns that's on the cover, right? Is that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, the cover depicts uh, the scene in the hospital room when he's come out of surgery and uh, he's still soaking up blood like a dry sponge every time they have to keep changing out the blood bags on it. But uh, he's, a, he's a bit mangled from uh, being uh, hit with a sniper's bullet in the, in the shape and size of an 18-wheeler, which just basically creams him and his car and he wakes up in the hospital and one of the characters there uh, he, he's he's trying to ward off an assassination by one of the gray sisters who shows up uh, posing as a nurse at the same time uh, there's a candy striper there and if somebody points out that no one's worn a candy striper outfit in what, 20 two or three decades outside of a bad porno movie. And so she may not be who she seems to be, but she seems to know as much, if not more, about what's going on than Chris does, which makes her a person of interest. Well, it turns out that Annie Harkwind um, supposedly has a grandmother in the mix, and I don't want to say too much more about that either, but it turns out there's, there's a witchcraft in the family, and she's recruiting Chris to help her get to uh, a weirding that's going to take place within a few days where a a large coven of witches are coming together, or practitioners, as they prefer uh, to use the term, uh, to make sure that Pandora's box is found, sealed, and protected against ever coming open again. And so she wants him, because all the portents say that he's important to the process, to help her get to the weirding circle. Well, unfortunately, it turns out, and again, I don't know how much I want to give away. 
Well, we could. We should probably say that that Pandora's box is opened in order to make sure that the Trinity uh, explosion didn't do really bad things. <laughs> is that? Well, you know, it, it turns out that the plan to somehow just put some arcane seals on the lid isn't maybe the best idea as the only plan. And, and he starts talking to the the coven about, well, you know, are you going to bury this thing in concrete? Just because you put spells on it doesn't mean somebody can't come along with a big hammer or a hand grenade or something. And um, it turns out that the alternate process by which uh, the solution is acquired also ends up being a solution to Chris's ultimate um, circumstances as well. Yeah. So there, I mean, it, it, it's a witch in time in that Annie Harkwin is using Chris to travel across multiple universes to get to this weirding to try to, to prevent the end of the universe, right? <laughs> Basically. You know, that ties back into Dead Easy because Chris was in the proximity uh, when Cthulhu uh, in his spaceship of the gods returned to his own great dimension. But in doing so, basically unspun time. There was a, a time warp effect that also affected him in the area of uh, effect. And so now he is somewhat displaced. And when he is unconscious or asleep, he passes into an adjacent uh, timeline in the multiverse. And the changes are so subtle at first, he doesn't recognize that anything has really changed. But as events heat up, he finds that, yeah, the timelines start to really show significant differences, and he's unable to control it, and he is uh, to a degree. And that plays into part of the plot as well, but we won't, we won't get into specifics. But um, it also changes the trajectory of, dare I say, I don't know if I want to say the word reward, but in Chris's final disposition, it, uh, it, it enables him to have something he had lost and find uh, peace in a way he wouldn't have expected with some additional bonuses, shall we say. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and he is... One of the problems you have in the book, which you solve... Um, nicely by being kind of merciless with some of the, the things you send him up is that he has gotten to be pretty powerful by this point. Um, he ain't some, he has someone to be, he has a power to be reckoned with and, and magically in this world. Right. Um, yeah, which, which doesn't help when you're trying to always fly under the radar. It just keeps attracting the attention of bigger and badder things. And, uh, uh we might say, uh, to an earlier point, uh, he has lost a number of people in his life, but this book marks the return of some of the characters you would not expect. Among some of the people that do return is Elizabeth Bachman, Louis Beru, who, well, how could they come back? They're both dead. Uh, Volpia comes back. J.D. Um, we J. also D., have, yeah. Uh, yeah, we also <laughs> have the return of some other people you wouldn't expect. Some of them are dead, and some of them are just keep popping up like uh, <laughs> like crabgrass. Um, I won't give too much more away on that front, but there are some returning characters before all this is solved, and um, some alternative history characters as well make brief appearances uh, from the wings or off stage, as well as briefly on. Um, this was an interesting book in that there were other plot lines that had to be ruthlessly excised, and one of them was uh, the super uh, conducting super collider, which makes an appearance around the Maitland Ranch or the Maitland uh, proper, property, if you know what I'm talking about, um, which was actually a, a real thing down near uh, was it Waxahachie, Texas. The superconducting mm -hmm. super collider that was abandoned back in 1993, but it would have been like, gosh, about three or four times larger than the uh, Large Hadron Collider at 
concern. And it was abandoned. Instead, I, I moved it up to the uh, Oklahoma-Kansas border because there was a ley line convergence there that I felt was important to the plot. And then a whole plot around that, which changed somewhat radically in, in the final version of the book, because we would have been talking two more books, I think, otherwise. So uh, I, I tend to overstuff the books sometimes with uh, the uh, extra plots and, and backstories. And uh, this was one where I, I think I made it leaner and meaner. Yeah. I mean, well, that's what's amazing about, you know, we're, we're sitting here and talking about all these various elements, and yet in the book it comes together so well. You bring it all together in this in this uh, weird, cool mixture. Um, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't even begin to ask you how you do it, but um, there's a lot of craft that goes into these. It would have been a lot easier back when I was writing One Foot in the Grave if I knew there were going to be five novels. And I, I wrote each book successively, trying to make it a standalone so that anyone picking up a book out of order or a later book in the series would read it and kind of understand a little bit of what had happened and, and put the pieces together on the fly. And then the book was great on its own. But this book was probably the hardest because we're not only five books in now, but so much has happened, and, and to really close the circle, to really do Chris's arc justice, there were, there were old threads that needed to be brought back in and, and tied off, uh, rejoined to the fabric, and so that the whole weave uh, hopefully does complete. I mean, there's always going to be some, certain people who want to know what happened to this character or why something didn't go a certain way. I guess, you know, there's always characters, there's always readers who want something a little more. But I think, I hope I, I, I satisfied um, most of the readers here with uh, doing both Chris and, and, and his cohorts justice in the end. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the characters. Um, it, there's a lot, but um, some of the main characters. We talked a little bit of Anne. Um, what about um, Carmela? Uh, Carmela Panu, Panu uh, who, keeps, who keeps Poppy, who won't go away. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, Carmela Lefanu, I should mention that uh, you know, Carmela, the name came from uh, uh, Sheridan Lefanu's story, Carmela who was really one of the first uh, vampire stories out there. I'm, you know, vampire stories go back hundreds, if not thousands of years. But as far as the literature goes, Le Fanu's, uh Carmela predated uh, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula by around, well, was it 26 years or so? So she was, she was out there before Dracula was in the literature. And it seemed a fitting name for a character who's... Uh, who keeps popping up and has become very... Uh, originally, she starts off as a character who sees Chris as uh, a resource to her power grab. But uh, by the time we get to A Witch in Time, she's, she feels a lot more for him. And in the end, because she, she's traveling with him, she's also unstuck in time and can't go back to the home and the people she knew. So she's really uh, a captive to his situation. And he ends up, that's another burden for him. As much as she annoys him, and as much as her advances make him uncomfortable, especially considering the company he's keeping, uh, to keep a certain secret there, um, he also now feels responsible for her, which is an additional burden in that he's carrying towards this long slog towards the end of what he hopes is the end of his life and the end of his existence, so he won't know pain uh, much longer. And um, it's another reason why he's so tired here in the end and uh, just, wanting, just wanting closure so that whether there's a heaven or whether there's an afterlife, he just doesn't want to be in this life anymore. And it's, it's, it's a real struggle for him. 
he's in a dark place, as we said at the very beginning. Yeah, but he, uh, he, he snaps out of it long enough to fight off the, uh, <laughs> the, it, he has to keep going because he's got this. He, he's got an obligation to, to try to stay alive as long as possible, but at the same time, he can't help but, but, and, and as we talk about how dark the beginning of the book is for him, uh, yet we still find, I think we find humor even in his coping mechanism. Um, the fact that he's so depressed, he, he can't even be bothered to take a shower or, or do a load of laundry. It's easier to order clothes on over the internet than, than you know, do a washer and dryer cycle on on his own clothing. And uh, how he doesn't leave the house except to meet with the accountant, which which is a faithful trip. <laughs> yeah, because the real the real. Um evil enemy that, that does strike a dreadful blow to him is the IRS. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the IRS, you know, they couldn't get Capone on racketeering charges. They couldn't get him on criminal behavior, but the IRS finally took down Al Capone for tax evasion. So if you're looking for a relentless uh, force out there in the world that, that everyone fears, it's, it's the Internal Revenue Service and the tax audit. And Having mm-hmm. financial accounts that were deeded to him by Vlad Dracul himself and predating his life by several centuries, that that eventually threw a red flag somewhere along the line. Whether uh, his enemies pointed the IRS at him or they just you know, caught up to him on his, his various accounts, uh, we may never know, but they certainly show up. Uh, and they would seem to be... Uh, uh, his biggest problem until, of course, the next bigger problem comes along. Yeah, well, that's certainly going to if you if if you have Dracula's money, you are definitely going to get an audit flag for sure. So, so what about um, what about Vanna North? She's another character we meet at the beginning. Um, we talked a little bit about her. Brett's blonde, strong as he calls her. Um, yeah, she's. Uh, He's an enigma. He, he, she shows up, and here we've got one guy flashing his badge saying uh, U.S. Treasury, and then you've got her flashing her badge claiming to be Interpol. And uh, she even is, helps him break out of the hospital and uh, escape, uh, although she's not necessarily a welcome accomplice with the other people on the bus. Uh, nonetheless, uh, she, she turns out to have her ties to Norse mythology. Um, as uh, one of the Norns refer, I can't remember if it's one of the Norns or Chris who refers to her as a ball holoba that girl, and uh, she's there to recruit him for um, the end of days events that are coming up because uh, the Norns are always looking for doughty warriors who uh, who can uh, assist them in in the great battle to come, and he's. He's already trying to multitask up to his armpits, and this is just a, another challenge. So we've got Norse mythology. We've got the Norns showing up at one point. We've got uh, Greek mythology with all kinds of uh, characters. And then, of course, when we start uncorking things toward the end, we have a return of the, um, of the um, you know, I'm having a moment here. <laughs> We have, uh, oh gosh, the Cthulhu, um, the office. Yeah, the Lovecraftian stuff. I hope you would. <laughs> I hope you're editing this. <laughs> um, our, um, who wrote, who wrote the, sure. the H.P. Lovecraft, Lovecraft alien, uh, oh, Lovecraft. I, alien. I didn't think Lovecraft. I was, I was having a senior moment. Yeah. Um, we have the whole Lovecraftian mythos, uh, re-erupt as creatures that he might imagine and others are, are, are trying to get through that cracking seal on the Pandora's box to, to flood the world with darkness. Not only our world, but the adjacent timelines as well. So he's not only, you know, we've raised the stakes where Chris is not only having to save his own life, or save the lives of his friends. He's not even saving this world. He's saving the multiverse, uh, so to speak. So, 
Um, again, the stakes have never been higher. And there are also, but there are also your your uh, your um, standard horror monsters as well. He takes on. Uh, we should say Carmela is a vampire, and she's. Um, Trying to get him to come to New York and take on his duty as head of the New York Vampires, right? At the beginning, he's really shirked uh, that whole job. Of course, as he points out, when he was in New York, people were always trying to kill him there, and that doesn't stop them from sending people down down to where he is in the Midwest again. But at least uh, it's not. He wasn't as busy dodging attacks as he was when he was in New York. So, yeah, he wanted to wash his hands the whole thing. When, when you're trying very hard, and this has been a theme throughout the books, he's, he's really struggled with the idea that as each change occurs and his, his need for blood increases, he's trying not to be a monster. He doesn't want to become a monster. He fears becoming a monster. And the idea of being in charge of other monsters is something that he just, he wants to be as far away from as possible. And yet, in the past, he's also struggled with the opportunity to maybe do good, but the limitations of how much good he can do without increasing the chances that he'll die trying to do that. Although that may be looking pretty good to him now. Yeah. But, um, I mean, as he says, and, and one of the fun things about the books is that the, the vampires are basically self-serving evil um, who will turn on you at any moment that it's to their advantage, right? Well, that, and yeah, that's the assumption. But I think as, as the book goes on, as the books go on, there's also the recognition that monsters of every stripe are like people. There are the evil assholes, and then there are the ones who are driven by uh, uh, just the needs that their existence have imposed upon their physical structure, their bodies, uh, their mm -hmm. their minds. Uh, I, I dabbled in the second book, uh, one uh, dead on my feet, with a religion that had started up um, with a certain character who started preaching to uh, the preachers of the night on the concept of the Church of the Open Kingdom. You know, Christians believe in the cross as a symbol, which is, uh, of course, a symbol of torture and death. And he was just opposing the symbol of uh, the empty tomb after the resurrection of Christ, if you want to go in that direction, as being a symbol of of death not being the final state, and if an empty tomb is a symbol also for religion, that perhaps there is a place in faith for creatures of the night who have always been told that they're damned and that they're they're evil and that they have no choice but to be evil. And so I think one of the things that Chris finds along the way is that yes, there are, there are really dark evil things out there, but among some of his allies that he picks up along the way are creatures that would be considered monsters, but maybe are just like him, trapped by the circumstances of their existence to need blood or need other things. He, he, we may recall the situation he had with the zombies next door when he was putting the TV out in the backyard for movie night for them and how uh, not all zombies are terrible brain-eating uh, creatures, not all vampires are necessarily out to to kill you, at least the ones who get to know you and may have better instincts. So Carmela is kind of a symbol of that that transition from someone who would have killed him and, and or used him to her own purposes to someone now that she still has trouble uh, in her relationship with him in being the kind of person that she should be, but... It's, I think it's evident that she's trying a lot harder now and uh, trying to find a way to bring closure to that relationship too is, is kind of an interesting challenge. Yeah, yeah. And uh, probably, I mean, the best way to maybe close off talking about uh, things and without giving too much away is that one of the characters observes that, that Chris has a um, – he's kind of like uh, – symbolically a Fisher King of sorts of the multiverse. Yeah. 
And this is the cha- this is the book where he comes out of the you know, from the wound back. That's true. And I think one of the things I've wrestled with in the series is that there there are stories of the protagonists who take the bull by the horns, who take the sword in their hand, and they they go out to to conquer or or seek the solution. Chris has been always the reluctant hero, and he's he always tries to do the right thing, but he hasn't sought to to be a leader. He hasn't sought to be a solution. He's only trying to live his life uh, as a decent person and do the right thing and, and increasingly try not to become a monster. But call it fate, call it a divine plan, call it whatever, he's always drawn into these conflicts. And his solutions sometimes have been very passive rather than being the person who makes everything happen through his own strength or force of will. It's sometimes through his allies and through the relationships he's forged is he able to bring together the kind of um, solution, the kind of um, synthesis from thesis and antithesis to a synthesis that that brings the elements together to find an unexpected way through into the next stage of the journey. And so yeah. at the end when he's holding hands with... Uh, the other people who have come to this place in time where it's do or die, where it's uh, either we save the universe and sacrifice ourselves or what, he finds himself again not being necessarily the person who made everything happen, but without him, none of it could have come about. It's, It's through his coalitions, through his relationships, through the choices he's made to be a good person rather than uh, use the dark gifts that have been given to him to acquire power, to acquire mastery, to take what he can take without consideration for others, that good has prevailed. And in the end, again, it's that, I don't want to say passive, but almost passive approach of just being the right person on the chessboard at the right time doing the right thing. Yeah, but I mean, the other thing about Chris is that um, he is, when the time comes, he is, uh, he's really smart and he comes up with shit, uh, comes up with solutions that um, that are surprising to the reader. And you realize he's been thinking all along about this. Um, and and um, it, it, in the moments when he does act, it's really cool and, and, sideways actions that um, take the bad guys by surprise. Yeah, I, I, I like to call it MacGyvering. He MacGyvers his way out or through situations. One of the guiding tenets of doing the series is never do what's expected. Always do the unexpected. So, you know, you can you can put all kinds of artillery in his hands. That's not going to be how he, you know, how he deals with the situation or... or or what would be the logical solution is taken out of his hands, or he tries it and it doesn't work, and he has to think on his feet. So, yeah, I, Chris, Chris has stayed alive. As I point out, most of the things he's up against are faster, stronger, older, and more experienced than he is. So he, he can only overcome um, his adversaries through his wits and through making intelligent choices. And as he says in in the latest book, uh, when he's confronting one of the people who is not who she says he she is, he says, I've learned to do research. And he taps his computer because he's using the Internet even then to prove that she's not who she says she is. Um, I like the fact that, that Chris doesn't, win through strength or through um, violence. He wins through outthinking and outmaneuvering his adversaries. And uh, I'd like to think he's clever when he's dealing with multiple mythologies that are all kind of colliding at the same time. So I, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you appreciate that. I, I have a readership, I think, that really appreciates that kind of character and the fact that uh, 
a great deal of thought goes into the background of the situation. Um, you know, in, in, in this book, we talk a, a, a bit about uh, the Manhattan Project and Project Trinity and the first atomic bomb test and how that ultimately plays into um, the end game of this story. Um, Chris, Chris is a guy who I try to surprise the reader by not always telegraphing the punch when it comes, but I try to also include them into um, a lot of the material that goes into Chris's decision. There's a lot of backstory and a lot of research, and I sometimes punish them a little bit. I try not to do info dumps, but I try. I think I've had readers who truly appreciate um, the amount of history, true fact, and true science that goes into every book so that when Chris uh, pulls a rabbit out of the hat, it's a complicated process to get that rabbit in the hat in the first place and that it all makes sense and comes together when he does. Yeah, yeah. Well, the book is A Witch in Time or Something Wicked This Way Comes by William Mark Simmons. And um, it's at booksellers everywhere at the moment. Um Thank you so much for being with us, Mark, and tell, and talking to us about this. Uh, the, the I guess it's the final book in the Half Life Chronicles, or at least uh, a resting place. That's the idea, uh, and I'm happy to to have wrapped it up in a big red bow uh, for Chris and the readers. On the other hand, we killed Chris so many times; anything is possible. But I'd like to think that that we have really closed the circle here in the series. Yeah, well, this is a great, uh, a great finale. Thank you so much for uh, talking to us about it, Mark. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts. Until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them, he united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector, a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. Omans nodded thoughtfully. I've come to give you your new orders. That was a strange choice of word. Orders implied some necessary action on his part, there was only one order that seemed likely to be given, and his sword would disapprove. Am I to kill myself, then? That seems to be the logical choice, but the Vidal delegation wouldn't hear of it. They didn't care what was done with you, as long as you died by a hand other than your own, preferably in combat, but they grudgingly accept execution. They're willing to take some risk to get their sword back, but they refused to simply throw it away. It took some debate before they agreed to turn you over to me. So no, Ashok, you will not kill yourself, though when you hear your orders, you may wish to. He couldn't imagine what else it could be. Unless they wanted him to walk from here to the capital, naked and barefoot, probably starving, and dueling every desperate fool along the way, all so the whole world could mock him before he presented himself at the Inquisitor's Dome to be strung up and sunburnt to death. 
But if a penance walk was what justice required, then he'd gladly do it. I will serve. Have you been to the lands of Great House Akershan? Yes. The order has sent me before. Good. I'm sending you again. Akershan was far to the south. It was a cold, desolate place with tall, rocky shores overlooking an icy sea infested with demons. Yet just beyond the ice coast was Fortress, the impenetrable island of criminal fanatics and their deadly magic. Ah, a suicide mission. This was a much better death than he'd hoped for. Ashok's expression must have changed because Omand hesitated. The condemned should not smile. Yes? Since I'm to die, it is wise to let me take some lawbreakers with me. I will gladly attack Fortress. You would, wouldn't you? For the leader of such a nefarious, secretive order, Amand laughed like a regular man. Ashok had expected something with more cruelty in it. He didn't understand why the Grand Inquisitor thought that was so funny. But then Ashok pictured Ungruvidal, lost on the floating ice or sinking to the bottom of the sea where demons lived. It would be best if I left my sword here. Once I'm dead, it can choose a new bearer. That is the most honorable solution. The Inquisitor wiped his eyes. Tears were just another form of salt water. I must say, Ashok, you're everything they made you out to be and more. Breaching fortress is a task that entire legions have failed at, but you would surely try. From your reputation, you'd probably even discover a whale that miraculously hadn't gone extinct and train it to carry you across the sea. The way a man's mouth disappeared so quickly suggested it had never existed at all. I'm afraid your assignment is far more mundane than that. A prophet has arisen among the castless in Akershan and started a rebellion. He had heard something about that from Blunt Karna. It was surprising that over a year later, this would still be a problem. Do you wish for me to find and kill their prophet? Finding and killing seems to be your solution for everything, isn't it? Ashok shrugged. Amand leaned forward on his chair and lowered his voice conspiratorially. Yes, you will travel to Akershan and find him. Very well. Only you're not to kill him. You will protect him. Ashok blinked. I don't understand. Since it was your title for twenty years, I have assumed a greater familiarity with the concept. Your orders are to find the castless prophet, pledge your services to him, join his rebels, and do as he commands. He is to be your new master. Omand paused to let that sink in. It was the Inquisitors who skulked about in the shadows pretending to be things that they weren't. Inquisitors often lied about who they were to infiltrate cults and criminal conspiracies. They were skilled in deceit and trickery. I'm no Inquisitor. I'm not speaking of going undercover, Ashok. A man's voice had turned low and dangerous. Oh no, you're far too noble for that. You're many things, but you're not a liar. There's no hiding your identity. You'll present yourself to this prophet as yourself. Ashok the Blackheart, the castless murderer, the fallen protector in all your infamy. And you will swear allegiance to his cause and his false gods, and you will follow his orders as if they had all the might of the capital and spoke with the voice of the presiding judge himself. You will serve for the rest of your days. That is your punishment. Mind reeling, Asha couldn't respond, couldn't speak, 
could barely think. It was as if the prison cell was spinning around him. Omand pulled out another piece of paper and handed it over. Read this. It was, as Oman said, the written orders were clear. Ashok was to join the castless rebels. Ten members of the committee had signed off, and it was stamped by the presiding judge. Their word was law. Why? The why never mattered to you before. Do you question the validity of these orders, prisoner? No. Good. But the dumbstruck look on your face amuses me, so I will tell you why. Every man has a place. You're a castless criminal, so your place will be with the castless criminals. This is your obligation. This is your sentence. The rest of your pathetic life will serve as an example to any who dreams of transgressing. If you were a normal man, I would take away your life. But your life is the law, so I'm taking that instead. Ashok couldn't breathe. This was worse than death. This was banishment, and not just banishment from a house, but banishment from all of society. This was the most dishonorable punishment imaginable, not just dying as a lawbreaker, but living as one. In a daze, he tried to unbuckle his sword belt, but his fingers had become too clumsy. What do you think you're doing? Leaving my sword here. And Gruvedal can't be dishonored like this. The sword goes with you. No, it can't. Ashok looked up, confused and hurt. The sword was more important than the bearer. Bearers lived and died, but the sword symbolized the strength of a house. It'll surely be destroyed. The law has spoken. You're still the bearer. But great house Vidal never should have let your foulness pollute the world. Now they will pay for their transgressions. Amand hissed. There had been no Vidal signatures on the second document. Judgment had been given to more than just Ashok today. Listen carefully now. For you to fail in keeping these instructions is to disgrace the sanctity of the law even more than you already have. These are your final orders. You will take Angru Vidal, and you will leave tonight, in secret. You will sneak out like a thief. You will speak to no one. You will let no guards see you. All will believe you to be a coward and an oath-breaker. You will leave Vidal as quickly as possible and not look back. You will travel to Akashan without delay. Allow no one to stop or detain you. You're forbidden from ever speaking of this meeting. You are bound from ever talking about these orders or the names upon them. As far as the world knows, you are nothing but a castless criminal with a magic sword. Thus says the law. Thus. Thus says the law. Do I have your oath? Asher couldn't form the words. Give me your oath. I swear to follow these orders, he whispered. Amand reached out and snatched the papers from Ashok's fingers. I told you that you'd rather kill yourself. He stood up, walked away, and thumped his fist against the door. An inquisitor on the other side opened it for him. Ashok felt as if he'd taken a severe blow to the head. It was taking all of his concentration to stay on his knees, and not fall over. He thought about taking Angruvadal out and plunging it into his guts. It would have hurt far less. This was a betrayal of everything. Armand paused in the doorway. I must admit, of all the many terrible things I've done in my career, this is the harshest punishment 
I have ever dispensed. Farewell, Ashok. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, and that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, thanks to Bain intern Victoria Lambert for editing help, and the podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a trip through a magically changed American heartland where Kansas is now the highest point on earth, and all her denizens are Sherpas with cool llama coats and cleverly clasped mukluks. Plus, thanks, praise, and plaudits to William Mark Simmons, author of A Witch in Time. Please join us next time here at the Hammering Heart of Science Fiction and Fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. 